So, in the last video I talked about the beginnings of Greta Gerwig's career, both as an actress and as a director. I briefly explained the mumblecore film movement and analyzed two incredible movies, Frances Ha and Lady Bird, her directorial debut, taking into account the themes of domesticity, womanhood and nostalgia. I gotta be honest with you, this series was first conceived as divided into parts. In both parts I would analyze two Greta Gerwig films. In the first one I analyzed Lady Bird and Frances Ha, and in this one I would analyze Little Women and Barbie. Yet, in the process of writing about Little Women, I found out that I love it too much and cannot shut up about it. So, this specific video turned out to be a very long love letter to Lisa May Alcott, Greta Gerwig, and Little Women. I will talk about the historical context surrounding the publication of Little Women in the 1800s and the life of Louisa May Alcott, in order to see how Greta Gerwig looks into that to create what I consider to be the best adaptation of Little Women ever made. This is the first adaptation from a literary work written and directed by Greta Gerwig. It was actually nominated for the Best Adapted Screenplay in the Academy Awards. But sadly, the winner was Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit. It is a good movie, don't get me wrong, but I think that what Gerwig accomplished in her adaptation of Little Women is, albeit more subtle, a much bigger feat. Let me explain. Little Women was first published in 1868 by the Roberts Brothers Publishing House. It was Thomas Niles who wrote to Louisa May Alcott asking her to write a book about girls and for girls. And she wasn't really happy about the prospect, really. She even said, never liked girls or knew many except my sisters. So what did she do? She wrote a book about her sisters and their childhoods together. However, this depiction of their childhood wasn't really accurate. The first book encompasses the year where Mr. March goes out to fight in the American Civil War and ends after Beth recovers from her first episode of Scarlet Fever. This first part focuses on Alcott's happy memories and excludes mostly the Alcott family's struggle with money. The book was highly successful. It turned out that it appealed not only to girls, but people of all ages, including boys and parents all across America. Some fans even wrote to Alcott to ask her who the little women would end up marrying in the end, which I find a little sad because Alcott wrote these eager, ambitious female characters with aspirations of their own and all the audience wanted to know was who they ended up with. In the words of Alcott herself, they wrote to me asking who the little women marry, as if that was the only end and aim of a woman's life. Besides, they specifically wanted Joe to marry Laurie, and this was not only a reader issue. The publishing house also demanded that a second part be written where all of the little women were paired up. They insist, wrote Luisa, on having people married up in a wholesale manner which much afflicts me. In consequence, in the second part of Little Women, which was published in 1869, we see the March sisters going through life being adults. Meg gets married to John Brooke, Joe and Amy pursue their artistic aspirations in New York and Europe respectively, and Beth still lives with her parents. By the end, all of them are married, except Beth, who ends up dead, due to another episode of Scarlet Fever. Yet, even though Alcott had to conform to the readers' and publishers' demands, she still found a way to not give them what they wanted. Amy, the sister that most girls disliked, marries Laurie, and Joe marries Professor Bear, an old, poor, and funny-looking guy. In the words of Louisa, Joe should have remained a literary spinster, but so many enthusiastic girls wrote to me clamorously demanding that she should marry Laurie, or somebody, that I didn't dare refuse, and out of perversity went and made a funny match for her. I expect vials of wrath poured out upon my head, but rather enjoy the prospect. What an icon. Ever since it was released, the novel has been adapted to many mediums several times, including, of course, cinema. The first two adaptations date from the 1920s, and they are silent films now lost. 
Then we have George Cukor's version from 1933 and the Technicolor remake from 1949, directed by Mervyn Leroy, and featuring Katherine Hepburn as Joe. However, all of these versions focus heavily on the romantic lives of the March sisters, giving very little time, if at all, to their personal and artistic aspirations. For example, you can see in the promotional poster for Leroy's version how the film was advertised as world's greatest love story. It was until 1994 that some attention was given to Joe's literary career in the adaptation directed by Gillian Armstrong, which featured Winona Ryder as the main heroine. Each film chooses to focus on different aspects of the text to align itself to the discourse of its time. For example, the 1933 version pays special attention to the March's economic struggles, since it was released during the Great Depression. The 1949 one focused more on the war aspect as it premiered almost at the end of the Second World War, and the 1994 version aligned itself to third wave feminist ideals. This means that because some of the things that Swikert apparently wanted to say were not explicit themes in Alcott's text, she turned to historical sources outside the novel to discover a history of 19th century women's progressivism, focusing on educational reform, abolition, and women's suffrage. Here we get closer to what Gerwig did in her own adaptation, since Robin Swikert, the screenwriter of the 94 version, also turned Joe into the writer of Little Women, adding metafictional elements to the text. Yet, the movie also tries to conciliate its feminist themes with more conservative themes, highlighting the importance of family, marriage, and women's self-sacrifice. Ugh. She also omitted and changed a lot of the novel's original dialogue for this purpose. I swear to god the whole story of how Little Women came to be is very interesting to me, but I don't want to bore you any longer, so let's move on. All of this context is relevant, I promise, since Gerwig's adaptation of Little Women was actually first conceived as a remake of the 94 version. However, I believe, of course, that Greta Gerwig accomplished much more than her predecessors, since she looks at Alcott's life and introduces those elements into her film without changing almost anything of the original text. She's amazing. When I started looking at her life and her journey as a writer and her journey as a woman, I realized that Joe was the hero of my girlhood and Louisa May Alcott is the hero of my womanhood. From the first scene of Greta Gerwig's Little Women, we see how she establishes a direct connection between Joe and Louisa May Alcott. The movie starts with Joe standing in front of the entrance of a publishing house, getting ready to sell one of her stories, and we can see in the door and the windows the seal of the Roberts Brothers publishing house. Then after accepting her short story for publication, Mr. Dashwood, who in the novel is the chief editor of the weekly Volcano newspaper, tells her this. And if the main character is a girl, make sure she's married by the end. Or dead, either way. In texts of this kind, therefore, the main characters are either married or dead at the narrative's close, a capitulation to the prevailing orthodoxy that limits the genre's capacity for social critique. So, from the first scene of the movie, we can see that Gerwig is engaging with Alcott's novel from a critical and an autobiographical standpoint. What a genius. We see other examples of this connection throughout the film, for example, in the next lines that resemble some included in Alcott's journals. I'd rather be a free spinster and paddle my own canoe. <laughs> Honestly, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think that they're not good Uh, but they're they're published in the in the papers, and people have always said that I'm talented. Oh, I think you're talented, which is why I'm being so 
so blunt. I can't afford to starve on praise. I'm sure there are many more of these instances throughout the film, but these are the ones that I could think of off the top of my head. If you know any more, please write them in the comments down below. Moving on, I think it is very interesting to see how Gerwig changes the meanings of all of these scenes by including the words of Louisa May Alcott herself. In the novel, these are moments in which the female character is driven into marriage and self-sacrifice, but Gerwig transforms them into moments of rebellion and freedom, which are aligned with the focus she is giving to her film. Greta has said that this film is about women, money, and art, and how women negotiate that, especially in a world where they are coming up short in the, in the transaction. The main difference between Gerwig's adaptation and Louisa May Alcott's novel, a part of Medium of course, is the narrative structure. The film is divided in two different timelines, the past and the present, and both of them have a starting point. The present timeline begins with the scene of Jo selling her short story, and the second one begins with a scene in which she accidentally burns Meg's hair. When the movie first came out, a lot of people believed that the past timeline was actually a set of flashbacks, but in actuality, they are two different stages of Joe's life being presented at the same time, in order to show how they reflect one another and to highlight the contrast between adulthood and childhood. The way the book was written, it was written in two books. In the first book, which is the childhood part, which is what I think people think of when they think of Little Women, and then the second book is the adult part, eight years later, and they're really twins and their companions. And I found as I started looking at the chapters that you could graft them almost one on top of the other. And they're like the adult answer to what had happened in childhood. And I, I thought there was just something incredibly poignant about it. Both timelines can be discerned from one another thanks to the color palette. The past is presented in warm and rosy colors, whereas the past is blue and cold. The first one contains scenes of family and domesticity, while in the second one, loneliness and melancholy reign. On that note, let's talk about the ending. There has been some confusion on whether Joe actually ends up marrying Professor Bear. Some argue that Gerwig's adaptation is an adult feminist, because yes, it denounces the way in which women are forced into subservient roles in both media and life, but it also has her main character marrying some guy in the end. Well, not quite. Let's see what happens. After Beth dies, Jo is submerged in a state of deep loneliness. In the book, it is during this time that she realizes all of her sisters have lives and families of her own, since Amy already married Lori. It is in this state that Professor Bear comes into her life again, and she ends up marrying him. In this sense, Alcott had to leave her strong-willed heroine, who detested the idea of marriage, vulnerable enough for her to ultimately cave in. And all of this just to make sure that the ending Joe got was justified narratively, beyond the demands of the publishers. In Gerwig's adaptation, we see Joe in a similar state, reconsidering the idea of having rejected Laurie. Perhaps I was too quick in turning him down. Lori. Do you love him? If he asked me again, I think I would say yes. However, this is one of those instances in which Gerwig adds dialogues of her own to highlight the independent spirit of Joe. Women, they, they have minds. 
and they have souls as well as just hearts and they've got ambition and they've got talent as well as just beauty and I'm so sick of people saying that that love is just all a woman is fit for I'm so sick of it but I'm so I'm so lonely. This whole monologue is a work of genius. Really, I see it being shared everywhere. TikTok, Instagram, etc., social media. But they always omit that last part. And I think that last part is what makes it so great. I can't think of anything more vulnerable and human for a woman than to admit that, in spite of her strong-willed and rebellious character, her current loneliness is just too hard to endure. It is after this that Professor Bear comes to visit, and she looks at him with starey white eyes and, just as she's about to let him go, we cut to a scene of her negotiating the selling of her novel. The one that is supposed to be Little Women. No one. She doesn't marry either of them. No. No! That won't work at all! Well, she says the whole book that she doesn't want to marry. Who cares? Girls want to see women married. No, it isn't the right ending. The right ending is the one that sells. Trust me, if you decide to end your delightful book with your heroine a spinster, no one will buy it. Well, I suppose marriage has always been an economic proposition, even in fiction. It's romance. <laughs> it's mercenary. Jo explicitly states that her heroine ends up a spinster, but Mr. Dashwood forces her to marry her female character in order to publish the book. Do you know who else went through something similar? And it is until this happens that we see the sequence where Joe chases Professor Bear to the train station. It's romantic. It's very moving. That's very emotional. Well, thank you. We can call the chapter Under the Umbrella. That's good. Perfect. In this sense, what we are seeing is not Joe getting both the boy and the book deal. The romantic scene is, in fact, the ending of the novel. What I mean is that they are talking about the rewrites as we are seeing them on screen. And all the past timeline is actually Joe's book. There's something afoot in terms of what we're saying the story is about. There's fiction, and then there's the writer of the fiction. It's like you start layering all of these different realities on top of each other. I would also like to add that if you pay enough attention, you'll notice that most of the scenes in the movie circle around Joe's literary career. We begin with a scene of her selling a short story, and we end with a scene of her negotiating copyright issues and seeing, with starey white eyes, her novel being printed which, in fact, actually looks exactly the same as the first editions of Little Women. One of the aspects that makes this more obvious is the dress Joe wears in the end, all pink and puffy sleeved. Did she wear anything like that before in the movie? Not at all. So that should be an indication that this is not, in fact, Joe, but the novel's heroine who couldn't have her true happy ending, who should have remained a literary spinster, just like the author herself. So, is Greta Gerwig's adaptation of Little Women the best adaptation of this novel ever made? In my opinion, yes, of course. It is a respectful homage to the novel, while also sticking to Greta Gerwig's personal style. In other words, it tells the story of a young woman struggling with adulthood and growing up while also trying to make her own way in a male-dominated world. And it homages both Louisa May Alcott and Little Women. Besides, in order to make such a comprehensive piece of cinema, Greta Gerwig had to look into all of the contexts that made the original work so culturally relevant. We are ready then to move on to the next part of this series, in which I will finally discuss Barbie to the best of my capability. See you there. Hey, if you made it this far into the video, thank you, I really appreciate it. Don't forget to leave a like and click the subscribe button if you enjoyed it. As you can see, I really like Little Women, so I would like to know what is your favorite Greta Gerwig film. Please let me know in the comments down below. 
Remember to check out my Instagram account to get updates on the next video and of course to check out also Janet's Instagram account where she uploads her amazing 3D designs. And well, without anything else to say, I don't want to keep you much longer. I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time.